But I think the one I want to focus on tonight, not because it's any more important than the other ones, is there is pure logical public policy reasons why abortion is bad for America, bad for our society, and bad for our people, and why, it, why Ro Roe versus Wade should be overturned. Now, the argument is that there is a fundamental right to abortion in America. That is the argument that those in the pro-abortion, so-called pro-choice community would say, that there is a fundamental right to abortion, that women in this country have a right to have an abortion. So what, what's the source of this right? As you engage people in this conversation, by the way, I want you to know, I've never met anyone that's admitted to me that they're pro-abortion. They'll say they're pro-choice, but almost everyone I've ever met has told me they personally disagree with abortion. They just think it should be legal. So that, that's pretty indicative already of, as a starting point of what this issue really is about. But where is this fundamental right from, to abortion coming? You engage people that believe in what they call abortion rights, and so when, sometimes here's what they'll say. They'll, they'll, they'll point to the circumstances of the pregnancy. They'll say, well, it's an unwanted child. This is a child that's going to enter life and not be wanted, not be cared for. Their parents don't want them. Perhaps, you know, there's a lot of unwanted children in the world. There are a lot of unwanted children in the world that are born. We know that they exist in this country, but especially all over the world. That cannot be the justification for this. Because if it was, then that would justify by logic that somehow all those unwanted children as well should be dealt with in a similar manner. And that's a horrific conclusion. It's an indefensible position. And so that cannot be the source of this right. And quickly they move on from the argument because it's absurd and they don't want to think about it. When they say that to you, that this is an unwanted child, and you say to them, listen, there's a lot of unwanted children that are born all over this planet. They're orphaned. They're born disabled. They're born to families that can't afford them. You can't possibly be saying that those children should also be eliminated. And so they move quickly away from that argument because it makes no sense and it's indefensible. The most common argument that I hear then, they quickly pivot is to the argument of, well, it's our body. It's a woman's body, and a woman has a right to do anything they want with her body. And let's recognize right now, there is a fundamental right. There is a right to control your body. You do have a right to your body. There's no doubt about it. You do have a right to decide what to do with your body and what others can do to it. There's no doubt about it. But there is another right, and that's a right to live. And so when you, when, and, and it, and, and when, so when you analyze this issue of pro-life versus pro-choice in America, what we basically have are two rights that are in conflict with one another. And we as a society must solve what do you do when two rights are in conflict with one another. And what we have here on the one hand is a woman's right to choose, whatever they mean by that, directly in conflict with an unborn child's right to live. And the fundamental question for our society is, how do you resolve a conflict like that when two fundamental rights that everyone recognizes exist are in conflict with one another? And so immediately the other side will say, well, our right to choose is more important than the right to live. And they'll say the reason why, the first argument they almost always relate to is because it's not a person. An embryo is not a person. A fetus is not a person. It's not a person yet. You say, well, if it's not a person, then what is it? Because if you left it alone, that's the only thing it can become. It can't develop into a cat. <laughs> so what, if it's not, if it has the DNA of a person. It was certainly created by people. And left to nature, it will become a person. By na but naturally. So it is a person. Then they'll argue, well, okay, maybe it is a person, but it's not a life. So what do you mean it's not a life? Well, it's, it's not a life because the first argument, the one they love to talk about is viability. It's not a life because it cannot sustain itself without the person who has a right to choose. It cannot live outside the womb. That argument, first and foremost, is already a slippery slope because viability is a moving target. Viability in 1973 means something very different than what it means today medically. Children that were not viable back then are very viable now. And we have no idea what other advances are going to occur over the next few years. So if you build it on that, you're already on a slippery sand. Then they go on and say, well, they're not viable without the support of the mother. But that also can't be a good argument. Because a newborn isn't viable without a mother either. 
a one-year-old child, a two-year-old child, leave a two-year-old child by himself. Leave a six-month-old child by themselves. They're not viable either. Even the day you were born, and for years thereafter, some of you are chuckling because leave a 19-year-old by themselves. <laughs> they... My point is this viability thing is not a good argument. Because the truth is that a child that has been born isn't viable by themselves either. Just because they're not receiving nutrition through an umbilical cord doesn't mean that they can sustain themselves. And by the way, the third reason why a viability thing doesn't, doesn't work is because you apply it to the other spectrum of life and you start to get scary. It starts to get scary. If in fact what we are saying is that human beings are only worthy of protection if they are able to sustain themselves independently of other people, that covers a lot of people in our society. It covers people that are disabled. It covers people that are temporarily incapacitated. It covers a lot of people. And so, there's, there is no compelling argument for why a woman's right to choose trumps a child's right to live. There isn't any. The fact of the matter is that we as a society, as a nation, from a political realm, have always understood that my rights as important as they may be, my rights end where other people's rights begin. Yes, a woman should have a right over, to choose the kinds of things that happen to her body. But that right is not unlimited. It ends when it begins to interfere with the right of another human being to pursue life, to have a life. And that's at the core of this issue. That's really what this issue is about at its heart. And an increasing number of people are understanding that. I think the public polling shows it. And I hope that it will continue to be reflected in our political debate. Because this is an essential issue. You see, I'm convinced that, well, let's ask ourselves, then why, if that's the case, if this is such a clear-cut argument, if it's so simple, the way you've laid it out, and there's, it's more complex than this, then why is the law of the land why it is? Why are 50% of the people in this country, maybe a little less now, pro-choice? Why do they disagree with the things you've just said? And the answer is because in this equation, in this battle between the right to choose and the right to live, the only ones who can vote are the ones with the right to choose. The only ones who can participate in the political process are the ones with the right to choose. An unborn child can't vote. Unborn child can't speak. Actually, they can. You speak for them. That's what you are. In this competition between two competing sets of rights, you are the voice of children that cannot speak for themselves, of lives that may never have a chance to contribute to our society and make a difference, of the unknown names of millions of children whose contributions to our world will never happen because their right to life was not respected. You vote for them when you vote. You participate in the political process when you participate. This is who you work for. Real people, no longer with us, who never had the chance to do what you or I did. And, more, and just as importantly, you are the voice and the vote of countless other children who have yet to be created, but whose life will soon be challenged as well. The truth is, I believe in all my heart that future generations will look back at this era in American history and condemn us. They'll look at what's happened here since 1973, and they will characterize this nation as barbarians. At some point, hopefully in our lifetime, but certainly at some point, people will look back at this practice and say, how could that be possible? In the way that we look back at the atrocities of the past, at things that occurred 100, 200, 300 years ago, at institutions that we as a nation ban banned and look at and say, how could people have supported this stuff? How could people have turned a blind eye to these things? How could people have ignored that these things were happening? The way we look at those things in history and condemn them, this era will be condemned for this. I have no doubt about it. 
Our job is to accelerate the process of getting there. To ensure that sooner rather than later, and God willing in our lifetime, we can arrive to a consciousness in this nation that this is wrong. That the right to life is a fundamental one that trumps virtually any other right I can imagine. Because without it, none of the other rights matter. There can be no liberty without life. There can't be a constitution without life. There can't be a nation without life. And there can't be other lives without life. I cannot imagine any other right that we have more fundamental and more important than this one. And so the reason why I'm so excited about the young people that are involved in this is because sometimes in contemporary life here in America, we come to believe that all the great causes are something lost to history. The past generations fought all the great battles. Abolition, the civil rights movement, women's suffrage. That all the great causes have already been fought and won. It's not true. In fact, maybe one of the most important battles that has ever been fought is the one that you're engaged in now. And so I encourage you to remain involved. Because at the end of the day, our nation can never truly become what it fully was intended to be, unless it deals with this issue squarely. America cannot truly fulfill its destiny unless this issue is resolved. 